Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanchman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and this is the first lecture with technical content in my Georgia Tech class called Guitar Amplification and Effects. So the main idea of this class is that we have everything that goes into your guitar tone. So that starts with the string, and we're going to end with the speaker and go through a lot of tube amplification along the way. So I've drawn a length of string here. I'm going to let X represent the coordinate looking down the guitar neck either direction. And we'll say that this has length L. Now, this over here on the left could be the nut, and over here on the right, that could be the bridge, or vice versa, it doesn't really matter. And what we'll do is we'll make a whole bunch of approximations, and we'll say that we have a function y x of t that indicates a displacement at this position x at a given time t. So our string might look a little something like this, say if we're plucking it in the middle. There's a lot of approximations we have to make in order to get here. Of course, any given point can go in all three dimensions, but we're assuming that there's a very small variation around some central resting point. If you simplify a bunch of physics and make a bunch of approximations, you can write down a partial differential equation where we take the double derivative of this function y with respect to x, and equate it with the double derivative of y with respect to t, our time variable, and there's a couple constants we need in here. We need t, which is the tension, and mu, which is the mass of the string per unit length. Now, if you're one of my Georgia Tech students, you should be following along with all of the math. If you're somebody watching this from the broader community and you're not following the math, don't worry about it. Just kind of stick around and just go with the flow, and there's various points where certain things will lock in in terms of us looking at what are the particular aspects that are important to you as a guitar player. So there will be a few specific take-home messages you'll be able to understand, even if you're not following all this business about partial derivatives, yada yada. Notice here I haven't bothered to write the explicit dependence on x and t here. You'll also see this expression written something like t, y with two little subscript x's equal mu, y with two little subscript t's. That's another kind of notation that you'll see. Now, the string is fixed at the nut and the bridge, so we have some boundary conditions. For all t, we can say that y 0 comma t and y l comma t so the displacement of the string at 0 and L is equal to 0 for all time. So the ends of the string are fixed. And we also need some initial conditions. So let's define GX as the position of the string at time t equals 0. So we'll write x comma 0 here. And let's VX be defined as the velocity of the string, which is defined as the derivative of y x of t with respect to t evaluated at t equals zero. And I'm trying to be distinct with this instead of just putting a zero in here. The reader can usually figure out what you mean, but it can be confusing, so I like to be explicit about that. So here I'm going to solve this using a trick called separation of variables. This doesn't always work, but it's really nice when it does. If you can use separation of variables, you can write your solution to the PDE as the product of two factors, each of which is a one-dimensional function. So we have Q, a one-dimensional function of time, and we have phi, a one-dimensional function of space. So we can take this candidate solution for Y and plug it into both sides of our PDE. So on the left, we have T, and then qt just hangs out as a constant because it's a constant with respect to x. And then we have the double derivative of phi with respect to x, which I'm going to just write by putting two dots above the phi. And since this is a one-dimensional function, there's no ambiguity as to what that means. And then on the right-hand side, we'll have a mu hanging out. And now we'll have q double dot t representing our double derivative with respect to time. 
And this time on the right, the phi function gets to hang out as a constant. So now let me divide both sides by t, q, and phi. So on the left, I'll have phi double dot x over phi x. And then on the right, we'll have mu over t times q double dot t over qt. Now, here's the key observation. The thing on the left has an x in it. It's constant with respect to t. The thing on the right has a t in it. It's constant with respect to x. But these are equal to each other. So this whole thing must equal some constant that we're going to call minus lambda, where lambda is bigger than zero. So I'm cheating a little bit here. I know ahead of time that this constant is negative. And this is something that you'll see that if you work at this a little bit more and you play around with different possibilities, you'll see that this turns out to be the only possibility. So it's not cheating too much. This minus lambda here is called the constant of separation. So from this, I can write two ordinary differential equations. I have phi double dot equals minus lambda times phi without the dot. And then playing around with the expression a little bit, I could write q double dot of t equal minus lambda t divided by mu q without the dot. So let's solve these ODEs. I'll call this ODE1 and call this ODE2. So looking at ODE1, remember that we have some boundary conditions. In particular, we remember that at the extremes of the nut or the bridge, so that's at the position of zero or L, we have zero. So when we see a differential equation like something double dot equals some constant times that something, we know that's going to have a solution of a sinusoid, and we can often write that as some sort of sum of a sine and cosine. But looking at this particular initial condition that says that phi zero equals zero, we know that a cosine isn't going to work. So let's try a sine. Let's try an expression of the form phi x is equal to sine square root of lambda times x. And I want to emphasize that the square root here just covers the lambda and not the x. And really, I should put a constant in front of here. That would be determined by various initial conditions and whatever later. I'm going to fold this into some other constants later, so I'm not really worried about it a whole lot here. And I'll leave it as an exercise for the reader to confirm that this is a solution to this ODE. Basically, when you take the derivative of the sine the first time you get a cosine, when you take the derivative a second time, you get a minus sign, which gives you the minus sign here. And each time you do that derivative, a square root of lambda pops out in front by the chain rule. And when you multiply those two square roots of lambda together, you get the lambda. So this pretty obviously satisfies the initial condition for x equals 0. But what about the case for x equals L? So let's write sine square root of lambda times L, and again, the square root covers the lambda, not the L, equals zero, and ask for what lambda does this wind up being true? Well, in order for this sign to evaluate to zero, we need what's inside the parentheses here, the argument to the sign, to be equal to some integer multiple of pi. Now, I'm going to write here k is equal to 1, 2, 3, dot, dot, dot. Technically, this is also true for minus 1, minus 2, and minus 3. But in that case, the minus sign and the sign just pulls out in front and folds into the constant. So those cases are kind of redundant. So if I divide both sides here by L, I get square root of lambda is equal to k pi over L. So I can write lambda is equal to k pi over L squared. So I really have an infinite number of possible solutions to one. And I'll indicate them with a subscript of k. And let's maybe write the constant as a k. Again, I'm going to fold this into some other constants later. And we have sine k pi over L, plugging in my expression for the square root of lambda, times x. So right now, for q, I need to be a lot more generic. So I'll write qk equal to, let's call it bk, maybe cosine k pi over l 
times square root of t over mu plus maybe let's call it ck sine k pi over l square root of t over mu. So here I'm being a lot more generic. We're having a cosine and a sine term. And here the basic structure is the same as what we had before, except now I need to put in the square root of t over mu. So when I hit this with the derivative twice, I wind up with this t over mu term here in front. So let's take this pi over l square root of t over mu and call it something. I'm going to call it omega naught. So omega naught equals pi over l times square root of t over mu. Remember t is the tension and mu is the mass per unit length. And l is what they call the speaking length of the string. It's the length of the string that vibrates. That's also called the scale length. All right, so this is now equal to bk cosine k omega naught t. Oh, I forgot t's in here. T, t, there should be some t's in there. Sorry about that. Plus ck sine k omega naught t. All right, so the phi and the q are coupled. So one possible solution to our wave equation is Notice I'm leaving a space here on purpose. Phi k of x times q k of t. But the wave equation is linear. So if I have a couple of solutions to the equation, then I can have linear combinations of those solutions. So really then I have an infinite sum of these that are possible solutions to the wave equation that I only really sort out once we add the initial conditions in. Let me rewrite this expression for ykt, putting the phi and q formulas in explicitly. And while I'm doing this, let me multiply the ak and bk together and the ak and c together, and I'll create some new constants I'll call alpha and beta. So I have sine k pi over l x times alpha k cosine k omega naught t plus beta k sine k omega naught t. Don't let the fact that this cosine and this sine are two different terms make you think this is fancier than it really is. You could use a trig identity and rewrite this whole thing as something like, I don't know, smiley face dude in hat subscript k. That would be a new amplitude. Cosine k omega naught t plus some phase term. So the stuff in the brackets is just a time domain sinusoid of frequency k omega naught t. Now, for k equals 1, that would give us a frequency of omega naught, and that's the fundamental frequency of our waveform. And then for k equal 2, k equal 3, etc., those represent harmonics that give our waveform some richness when we listen to it. And it's a good thing we have those because otherwise it will just sound like a tuning fork. Now, one approximation we made earlier is that we didn't include any damping in our differential equation, so this will ring out forever. Of course, any real guitar string that you pluck, you're going to have energy dissipate over time, so it will decay in amplitude. Now, each of these harmonics that you hear has a corresponding spatial mode that's the sinusoid in space. This Wikipedia page on harmonics has a really nice visualization of this. And essentially, you can think about each of these spatial modes as a vibrating up and down according to what the time domain sinusoid is doing. And guitar players can do a trick where they'll take their finger and say, put it halfway along the string. And by putting their finger there, they'll dampen the fundamental and the third, fifth, seventh, and other odd harmonics. And then the second fourth, and sixth, and so on harmonics. The even harmonics will ring out. And you could do a similar trick by putting your finger a third of the way down the length of the string, and that will essentially only leave the third harmonic, the sixth harmonic, and so on. You can also do this trick on a violin, or a viola, or a cello, or a double bass, or some other stringed instrument. Let's take a look at this omega naught here. Notice that if I want to decrease the frequency, I can increase the length of the string, I can decrease the tension, or I can increase mu. 
So that corresponds to something like the longer scale length of a bass guitar versus a regular guitar, or perhaps the more massive strings. Notice they're doing a little bit of both. Because usually you don't want to get a bassier tone by decreasing the tension. Doing just that alone tends to make the string sound flabby and rubber bandy. Now, if you want to have a higher pitch, then you can decrease the length or decrease the mass of the string, or you can increase the tension. Now, this is something you have to be very careful with when tuning. If you're trying to flatten the pitch of the string, you're safe. But if you're trying to make the pitch sharper, you sometimes run the risk of breaking the string. And this equation is why a Bassendorfer Imperial Grand is as massive as it is. All right, so let's find out what the derivative with respect to t is of this expression. And we'll need that in order to deal with the initial conditions associated with the velocity. So I've got my sum. So all of this stuff in front about the spatial mode, well, that's just a constant with respect to t, so it just hangs out. And then in here, we basically have this whole expression times k omega naught because that's what pops out during the use of the chain rule, and then I'll have alpha k sine k omega naught t, but when I take the derivative of a cosine, I get a minus sine, and then I'll have plus beta k, and when I take the derivative of the sine, I get a cosine. So let's talk about initial conditions. We had defined the velocity profile as the time derivative of our solution to the wave equation, evaluated at t equals zero. So here that's going to give us a sum going from k equal one to infinity of k omega naught beta k times my spatial mode sine k pi over lx because plugging t equals zero in for the sine term causes that term to go away and plugging t equals zero into the cosine term causes that cosine to go to one. And similarly, the initial condition on the position, gx, we had defined that as yx zero. And well, in that particular case, if we plug in zero for t, then this sine term winds up going away, and this cosine goes to one. So for g, we basically have the same kind of expression, except we have alpha k instead of beta k, and we don't have this k omega naught factor in front because we never took any derivatives, but we still have the same kind of spatial mode factor. So if the velocity term is zero and you just have a g term, that corresponds to plucking a string. So you might think of plucking a string as striking the string with a pick, but really as far as the local internal physics of the string goes, it's really viewing you as setting up an initial condition, setting the string at a particular point in space, and then when the pick leaves the string, that's when this differential equation starts doing its thing. Now, if on the other hand, you set g to zero and you have some v, that corresponds to something more like striking the string with, say, a piano hammer. And in the next lecture, we're going to look at some specific examples of this because it's different plucking or striking patterns that creates different kinds of harmonic series. Oh, one more thing before we close out. I should have mentioned this sooner. This omega naught is in terms of radians per second. If you want to get this in terms of hertz, which is what musicians really want to think about, you want to divide it by 2 pi. So it would be 1 over 2L square root of T divided by mu in hertz.